Journalism History, a podcast that rips out the pages of your history books to re-examine the stories you thought you knew and the ones you were never told. I'm your host, Terry Finneman, guiding you through our own drafts of history. This episode is sponsored by the Texas Christian University Bob Schieffer College of Communication, where students learn to practice journalism with the persistence, civility, and integrity embodied by legendary CBS News journalist Bob Schieffer. In this episode, Amy Easton Flake of Brigham Young University discusses literary works in the Revolution and the Woman's Journal, newspapers that suffragists started themselves to promote their cause. We've created five mini-episodes featuring suffrage researchers who spoke at an American Journalism Historians Conference. This is part three. Okay, my work focuses on the fiction and poetry in the Revolution and the Women's Journal. Uh, so Elizabeth Cady Stanton believed in the transformative power of fiction. The wrongs of society, she said, could be more deeply impressed on a large class of readers in the form of fiction than by essays, sermons, or the facts of fiction. End quote. Consequently, it should come as no surprise that in the Revolution, the journal edited that she edited for the National Women's Suffrage Association between 1860 and 1870, novels, short stories, and poems account for 15 to 20 percent of each issue. Likewise, short stories and poems held a substantial but largely forgotten place in the Women's Journal, which was the American Women's Suffrage Association. Through suffrage, historians have long overlooked poetry and fiction. Recent scholarship mentioned previously by Mary Chapman, Elizabeth Gray, and Leslie Petty illustrate that the literary works effectively complemented more polemical genres by appealing to emotion and personalizing political conflict, vividly depicting problems and solutions, dramatizing the wrongs women have experienced, and fostering sympathetic identification. Looking specifically at the works in the Revolution in the Women's Journal, I contend that these literary works illuminate the different perspectives, audiences, and missions of the two organizations, articulate and advocate the review of um, new womanhood, and um, the two organizations and their different um, views on that, extend the empathetic impact of journalistic reporting through dramatizing the wrongs women experience, and ultimately show how the two groups' disparate views on divorce and reforms most needed to improve women's position within marriage were crucial in defeating the call for union in the spring of 1870. To offer context for my argument, I begin with some brief background on the two organizations and the journals each founded. As most of us know, the 15th Amendment um, ripped the two organizations apart, um, with Katie Stanton and Susan B. Anthony withdrawing from the ERA um, to form the NWSA in May 1869. Six months later, in November, Lucy Stone and Harry Brown Blackwell, who continued to fold hats to the Equal Rights Association's founding principles, officially organized organized the AWSA. Each group pursued differing organizational models and strategies. The NWSA's leadership was made up primarily of women and focused on obtaining the vote through national action, either reinterpretation of existing constitutional amendments to allow female enfranchisement or the passage of new amendments to that end. The AWSA leadership was composed of men and women and concentrated on obtaining the vote through state amendments. The two groups diverged as well over issues and arguments. The NWSA made divisive topics like divorce, double standards of sexuality, prostitution, forced motherhood, economic vulnerability, and legal oppression part of their platform. The AWSA billed itself as a more conservative alternative to the NWSA and always kept suffrage as the defining issue. In providing a space for suffrage leaders to frame their goals, critique existing conditions, promote their ideas for change, and communicate and manage their differences from one another, these journals were integral to the formation of their respective organizations. When the revolution was under Katie Stanton and Anthony's sole control, it addressed the many issues facing women, such as double standards of sexuality, forced maternity, economic vulnerability, labor and education inequities, marriage and property laws, spousal abuse, infanticide, prostitution, women's oppression in the home, and of course the suffrage struggle itself. The journal's tone was aggressive. Authors condemned men in society for their mistreatment of women and called for women's rights on all fronts. The journal's readership was predominantly middle class, although Katie Stanton and Anthony sought to serve and attract working women by reporting on the meetings of the Working Women's Association, establishing a column entitled Working Women, keeping their subscription price low, and consistently advocating for the rights and needs of working women. 
in keeping with the American Association's billing of itself as a more conservative alternative to the National Women's Suffrage Association, the Women's Journal clearly focus was on the suffrage, suffrage campaign in individual states, pending suffrage legislation, AWSA proceedings, and suffrage developments in Europe. Directed at an audience of well-educated, socially involved women, the journal maintained a decidedly middle-class bias, rarely commenting on the difficulties facing female factory workers and domestics. It presented suffrage as a gateway to middle-class reforms, such as higher education for women, greater access to the professions, and equal property rights. Stone and her associates sought to show how suffrage could support middle-class female genteel norms. They promoted equality and expanded roles for women within fundamentally conventional settings and avoided controversies such as divorce, adultery, infanticide, and the abhorrent conditions of working women, which were, of course, a staple of the revolution. As time is limited, I will focus the second half of my remarks on the poetry found in these respective journals. In July 1869, Katie Santon set out a standard for the 50-plus poems, 11 short stories, and one and a half novels that would count for 15 to 20 percent of each issue until she stepped down as editor. She wrote, quote, We do not desire that the revolution should in any sense become what is called a literary paper. To us, as with Ruskin, the three fine arts are how to feed and clothe and house the poor. There are plenty of papers to tell people what they like to hear, where correspondents can indulge their artistic taste. In our paper, we desire that all articles should have a clear, direct humanitarian hand, end quote. Stated simply, Katie Stanton expected the poems and fictions published in her journal to be polemical first, entertaining second. For the first few months, much of the revolution's literary works upheld this creed. Alice Carey and Phoebe Carey, sisters committed to obtaining women's rights and well-known for their writings, respectfully wrote the revolution's first two poems, which questioned the current status of women in society and attacked the absurdity of men's hypocrisy. Phoebe Carey's poem, Was He Henpecked, features a husband and wife arguing over women voting and women's rights. With palpable irony, it displays how men often gave lip service to women's abilities and rights, but stifled them through their actions. The husband offers quintessential platitudes, but states he wants her, quote, for mine alone. He then continues, quote, you have your rights, tis very true, but then we should define them. We would not peck you cruelly. We would not buy and sell you. And you in turn should think and be and do just what we tell you. The idea that husbands enslaved their wives appears consistently in the revolution, particularly in editorials that describe the state of marriage in 19th century America as, quote, slavery on one side and tyranny on the other. Poetry and fiction contribute to this motif by expressing these sentiments through the voice of the perpetrators rather than the victims, a rhetorical choice that makes them more jarring and inflammatory. Other oft-expressed ideas that repeatedly receive poetic utterance in the revolution include the exoneration of fallen women, vast gender inequalities in the marriage relationship, and ideal love. Upon first consideration, the many well-known poems on ideal love by famous authors such as Elizabeth Barrett Browning, William Shakespeare, and Alfred Lloyd Tennyson that are republished in the Revolution appear to be at odds with the polemical pieces calling for women's rights or attacking inequities in the marriage state. However, a look at these poems in the context of the journal revealed that they actually offered an important contribution to the NWSA's call for a revolution in contemporary opinion on marriage, divorce, and love because they show love as it should be. In the longer version of my paper, I explain how the NWSA's call for divorce, as well as the respective reforms the two groups called for in the domestic state, are actually the separating side issues that keep the two groups apart when there is a call for union in 1870. Thus, the juxtaposed poems of ideal love with the harsh reality of the marriage relationship played an important polemical role within the revolution. Turning to the Women's Journal, it quickly becomes apparent that literature was not expected, as it was in the Revolution, to have a clear, direct humanitarian hand. Much of the poetry and short stories lack any connection to women's rights or the wrongs done to women. Analysis of the 50 short stories and 160 poems that appear in the first 50 volumes in the first year of the journal's history readily indicates its different audience and focus. Of the 160 poems, only eight, a mere 5%, deal with women's 
rights, wrongs, or advancing in some way women's place beyond that of wife and mother. The other 150 plus poems mirror the poetry found throughout 19th century women's and literary periodicals with themes of love, death, nature, and religion. This fact does not discount this poetry, but rather adds support to the argument that the AWSA used the Women's Journal to show women how supporting suffrage could be a part of accepting a middle-class persona. As Stone wrote, women could embrace the vote while still being, quote, a genuine woman, gentle, tender, refined, and quiet. As an example of this, the ideal woman presented on the front pages of the first two issues via two poems, fittingly for this journal, one by a man and one by a woman, is one that fits very comfortably in 19th century sentimental poetry. According to this poetry, an ideal woman should quote, find duties dear and labor sweet as rest, and for itself knows neither care nor fear. Her heart was gentle as her face was fair, with grace and love and pity dwelling there. The ideal woman presented in poem after poem is still the selfless, benevolent individual who finds strength in God and boys all those around her. Quote, she bravely defying the stormiest weather, herself sweetest sunshine, my glorious saint, never a care have I borne alone. By including poetry that celebrated the feminine ideals widely embraced in 19th century America, Stone implicitly but repeatedly argues that the AWSA's aims and goals were not revolutionary, but in fact compatible with middle-class sensibilities. The decision to not overtly politicize the poetry corner also underlies that the Women's Journal existed in a competitive market. Much more can, of course, be said about the poetry and fiction in the respective journals and the, how they further reflect the journal's aims, as well as it brings into focus the defining separate issues. Um, but hopefully get, this gives you a taste of what the poetry brings. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, and additional thanks to our sponsor, Texas Christian University. Until next time, I'm your host, Terry Fenneman, signing off with the words of Edward R. Murrow. Good night and good luck. Thank you.